Friday morning. Well done, everybody. Getting through another week. And uh, thank you for choosing to, uh, to round out your week, uh, spending some time with myself and, and Ben. Uh, so before I get into introductions again and introduce Ben and allow him to introduce himself and his role, um, thank you uh, so much for joining us on the breakfast session. I'll go through some of the housekeeping for um, if, you, if you've not joined uh, before. Um, we've been running these for a couple of, couple of years now, actually, uh, offline and online, um, and has some kind of great guests over the time. We, we invite people who are really kind of making changes in, um, in the work that they're doing in brand marketing. And so I would say events is kind of crosses between marketing and proposition development. Um, and uh, so I'm delighted to, delighted to welcome uh, Ben today. We're going to get into um, the chats in a, in a minute and um, we'll probably run for about half an hour to sort of 40 minutes. And um, there absolutely will be an opportunity to ask questions. So please put those into the kind of Q&A. Um, my colleague Scott will be um, grooming the questions and uh, we'll take a break halfway through at least for the questions and then we'll ask for a few more at the end so please please do kind of fire your, your hard and tricky questions through to Ben because I don't have to answer them so I've got an easy ride um, we are recording hope everybody's okay with that we record so that we can share it online afterwards so if the drop off or you want to share it with your colleagues please please feel free to do so you can find links on createfuture.com and on the YouTube um, and um, I think uh, I think that's probably it. We don't have to do the fire drill. Actually, I have to say I am annoyingly wet, got a delivery collection sort of coming, and so there's and I'm in the flat on my own. There's every chance it could come in the next twenty minutes. So apologies in advance if that happens. There's there's nothing I can do about it. You'll have to talk among yourselves. Um, great. Okay. Um, so with all with all that out of the way, um, uh, welcome to to, to to Ben. So. Uh, we've had a number of guests on this, uh, some, you know, from, from Adidas and Penguin Random House and um, uh, called Penguin, yeah, Adidas, Penguin, Expedia in the past and so on. And I'm delighted to add another um, client. They're not always clients, but I'm delighted to add a client this time uh, in Standard Life, uh, Standard Life Advice and, and Ben, who we've worked with, Ben and Andy, for the last um, what, couple of years, I'd say now. Yeah, on and off over the last kind of couple of years specifically helping um, to develop the standard life advice proposition. So I'm delighted to join us. We're going to talk about everything about the kind of retirement advice um, space. Um, uh, but before we get into that, um, Ben, do you want to introduce yourself and uh, maybe a little bit about your career and, and how you got to, to where you are? And then just tell us a little bit about the, the proposition as it stands today. Yeah, look, thanks, Nathan. Good morning to you. Good morning to everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming along. Um, yes, yeah, so Ben, Ben Hampton. I work at Style Life Aberdeen and I lead depends what's our retirement advice business. And that's really a, it's a hopefully innovative, we think it is, and a, a kind of growing hybrid advice offer. So it's a combination of a human, a human relationship is really, really important, but driving digitization and codification to kind of make it more accessible. That's what, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase affordable access to financial advice for people probably at the time when they need it the most, which is about retirement and what's next and how we deliver a plan for them for both the finances and really for what I call the life they've not yet lived. There's some of those emotional aspects which we'll come on to. So, um, yeah, from, I'm actually down in London, actually, for the benefits of home working. I'm at my, par um, my wife's uh, parents' house. We've been down traveling a bit of virtual working, but based up in Edinburgh, despite the accent, uh, from Hull in Yorkshire. Um, and I've been fortunate, I've had a, a kind of a decade of experience working in advice, workplace pensions, wealth management, um, at Standard Life Aberdeen and the various guises we've been in um, from strategy roles, proposition roles, distribution, marketing, and then, then kind of advice running, running a kind of an advice business. Um, I've been fortunate probably in the kind of experiences I've had. I think I've loved being on the front line. I was spent time with workplace employers and the, the kind of their pension scheme. So going to lots of different businesses and companies was fascinating. And then I was fortunate enough to have a stint as executive assistant to our CEO in the UK and Europe business. So look, fascinating to see how um, executives make decisions or don't make decisions sometimes. Um, but it was fascinating nonetheless seeing how business runs end to end. And the advice proposition is mainly a D2C offer, isn't it, you're, you're at, at the moment? Yeah, totally. So look, we, the, the key thing for us is, and we'll probably cover this as kind of talk some of the questions we want to cover, Nathan, is it's really about helping customers and actually trying to do that direct consumer themselves. And it's, it's in the challenge for the some of this is advice isn't well known. So it's, it's really about kind of direct consumer whether that's referrals from other parts of our business or partners, yeah. actually acquiring them directly through various different forms of, of, of paid acquisition, actually. And that's kind of exciting, but also challenging at times. So it's kind of making it all stack up. Well, look, you know, I'm because uh, we've known each other a little while, you know, I'm actually, I'm kind of, um, 
really invested in this this world of kind of retirement and, and some of the, the challenges that are facing the industry. And it was an eye opening for me um, uh, over the last working with yourselves and people like Hyman's Robertson, another client mm. who um, really, you know, kind of championing trying to get people to to, to engage with um, their you know their retirement planning and, and more. And you kind of think it's something in the dim and distant future that you really don't need to, to worry about. And I was definitely in that camp. Um, a few things happened to me kind of a couple of years ago. I got, got, um, I got, I got pneumonia a couple of years ago, got ill, gave me a bit of a health scare, got me thinking about like kind of provisions for, for, um, for, for thinking ahead. And, and obviously I'm kind of advanced. It was, I was 47 yesterday. Um, so some of the advanced in years. And I read a great book called The 100 Year Life as well, which kind of got me, um, definitely got me thinking in different terms about it. So all of those things have really been an education to me in terms of, um, the importance of getting this right, but also if we're, we're going to touch on this, mm. the, the, the fragile state, to be honest, of a, of a lot of people's kind of finances um, when they, um, and it's not just down to their own individual responsibility, you know, there's a lot of factors that contribute to that. Now, it's such an important part of people's lives. You would expect there to be a very healthy market for good advice. For this i read a great quote just very coincidentally this morning someone said there's a huge market for poor advice um but uh, you know the, the market for good advice you'd expect people to be knocking down your doors to get this this sort of but but, but that's not always the case so you know why why do you think the uptake of advice is sometimes quite quite low um you know does it does it potentially have an image problem you know what, what's what's contributing to this uh slightly head in the sands uh attitude sometimes yeah, look, I think I think all those things are really relevant. Um, I think what I'd probably start with saying perception is reality. So that undeniably perception plays a key part. And let's be honest, the fact you're asking that question and it's kind of a credible question illustrates the challenge. Mm. Um, I think it's personally, I think it's an accessibility and awareness problem. Oh, look, let's say rather than a problem, we're all positive people on a Friday morning, <laughs> an opportunity. So that, that's good. But I think the industry doesn't help itself. In the industry, the word advice means something very specific with standards rules actually huge safeguards for for the consumer compared to doing something to learn you think that a bit, that um, a bit off-putting please yeah the, the real world in everyday language advice is quite a, a quite a general term i think if if everyone on the webinar now could just just pause for a second and think the last time someone either you asked for it or they gave you or someone imparted you some advice from a friend or a neighbor and depending on your friends sometimes you don't even ask for that advice um but they give it anyway none of you will have probably had any high expectations regarding the quality and the professionalism of it. To consumers, advice really just means help and support. I, don't, I just don't believe customers naturally differentiate between the regulated and non-regulated forms of that support, even though the quality yeah. of that support varies wildly. So do you think, given that, you know, the advice is quite a broad term, do you think that there's, but, but in, in general parlance, but then in terms of a product offering, it's quite specific, you know, regulated. Do you think there may need to be maybe more of a spectrum of the way that people engage with around advice? Yeah, look, I've started, so from, I think from the informal and self-serves through to, you know, sitting across a desk with somebody. Yeah, I think people ultimately don't know, don't know what it is. And I think if we come back to, the industry talks about an advice gap. So we know the demand for help and support. If we talk about the retirement bit, as we're talking today, we know that you said it's a big part of your life. You, you thought it's the kind of thing you'd think, I might get a bit of help here to, as a, for big decisions, but this is a supply side problem when it comes to professional advice. And I think that accessibility part of that gap, mm. some people can't, can't afford to get financial advice because, because of the supply side, advisors have been able to move upstream and say, we well, need a certain amount of minimum wealth. So those minimum requirements exclude people. And I think these forces create an accessibility gap. And actually I think there's huge interest in that bit and the progress has been made in making advice more accessible, more affordable, what we've done in terms of that hybrid offer of digitization and codification, but with a human center. And going back to your point about different different executions, I think that's really important because for us, we had an ambition to do it without a human. And yeah. it just didn't work. It, you know, the, the reassurance, the confidence, the friction, the commitment cliff just didn't work. So you know, we, we pivoted quite quickly. I think for other settings and different life stages, the human could be a pain in pen in the bum. Um, actually, for some people that don't want that interaction, I think the market's, market's really hot enough. Royal London acquired a fintech firm called Wealth Wizards. I think they're really impressive and that's a potential game changer for them. M&G Wealth have just announced plans to create a hybrid advice officer. Look, that can see a return from the man from the proof, but digitally. So that's fascinating. I think all those things 
are only positive for the consumer. But I think the bigger challenge, which I think is what your question links to, uh, Nathan, is the gap around perception and awareness. That awareness part of the advice gap means people aren't aware what advice is, what it gives them, um, and why people like them should even consider it. So I think that does drive an image challenge, and it comes from a lack of understanding of what it is. So that's the industry's challenge to solve. It's not on the consumer to be able to work out what it is. We need to make it easier to be accessible and understand it. But I think the challenge is something we talk about a lot is it feels intangible. And for some, it's solving problems or realizing opportunities they didn't even know they had before that relationship. So that it's very difficult for them to imagine what value they're going to get from it. And just even the example you gave about health point, so many examples of triggers of some life event, it forces you to take that step back, oh God, and then that type of thing. So I think, that, I think that's really key. But I think that awareness gap is something I think everyone needs to work harder at. Of. Different channels will help. That helps the accessibility. But if people don't know what it is or why it's good for them, um, or why it can help them, that's a, that's a challenge we have to close. Has that, imp- has that influenced your marketing then, or when, when and where you try to engage with people in a different way, rather than just saying, yeah. like, for advice, have you, have you maybe looked at you know, what those triggers triggers are and, 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 and broken, broken your messaging down a bit more? Specific? Yeah, I think and look, Andy takes the credit for this, really. I think in terms of, we try to think of two segments and we called them, not, not that imaginatively, advice seekers, people that know who what advice is, are probably further in the consideration process, closer to the buying line, um, but they're comparing stuff. But that market's quite small. The market we've had more success with, arguably, is what we'd call the retirement researchers, people that have, know they've got a problem, but don't quite know what the problem is, that want to be proactive in solving it, mm-hmm. and it's then how we can help them to kind of take, look, low commitment actions and nudge them along. So, you know, bizarrely, we've just started doing a, um, a retirement guide, a guide, so it feels really traditional for what something I've said is that we're trying to be innovative, but we've put a purchase funnel around it and digitally, and people are just engaging with it off Facebook. So that kind of channel point is, is absolutely key. But yeah, thinking of those two different segments, unfortunately, the advice seeking segment is actually small because of um, because of that awareness gap. The need for advice is huge, but people wouldn't necessarily pop themselves into that segment, unfortunately, the more in that. Okay, they're, they're, they're not starting the research. And yeah. Um, the, you, you've actually, what, what would you say is the buying line? What typically is the buying line in terms of the people that you're advising then? You use that term, I think it's quite interesting. It's tricky. It's tricky. And one of the things probably um, to, to touch on is, so I'm, 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 responsibility is going to the individual, right? Responsibility is going to the individual. And that's well documented, right? It's documented around um, people living longer, stuff being passed from the employer to the to the, the individual. We won't talk about that. But the one thing we see that people don't really talk about is the choice of when and if to retire. Yeah. Like when and if. Like fascinating, absolutely fascinating, right? And that's a huge decision. And I think about the closest to the buying line. We've had a customer that keeps coming, one of the planners was talking to me about it. He keeps coming back and the guy keeps saying, I think I need to keep working. I just need to keep working because the finances are a bit, and, and the financial planner keeps on the same. So it's like, look, let's, let's almost have a moment with ourselves. We both know you can afford to retire. Yeah. We both know you don't want to. Yeah. And it's that buy. So I think it's, to me, it's one of the things, it's that emotional acceptance I think that's a really key step in it. Um, so the buying line for me is when you've got to that. And I think it's when you can get confidence for something that's intangible. I think people have a penny drop moment where they go, oh, I can see a weight's off my shoulders, a weight's off my mind. That's the closeness to the buying line. But look, for everyone, as anything, you can move really close to it and something drags you away. So the skill is focusing, I think, reacting from a marketing perspective on intent. What are those intent triggers? And I think it's a considered purchase. So we use a lot of kind of lead nurturing journeys. Um, whether it's email or other, other aspects to just nudge people but further along it but look advice can, advice can take six to 12 months sometimes for people to make that decision it's, it's not a short quick fast purchase sometimes i wish we were selling chocolate bars but, <laughs> but it's, so that, that advice journeys to go through and get you, you confident could take six to 12 months but i think what i get a sense of is and i've been working with you is you, you know people really ideally should be considering this earlier in their lives and, and, and starting the research, as you, as you said, and you certainly want to engage people yeah. earlier because the earlier they are, the more um, the opportunities are, there are to affect, affect their outcome. But for you, I think that, 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 that raises a challenge and that, that becomes quite a long life cycle then or a kind of a long relationship, you know, as opposed to, you think of an IFA, someone maybe walks in through their door 
you know, you set a session up, then you work with them for, for, for a couple of weeks over a few sessions and the plan's given back, you know, but actually what we're saying is you maybe need to change that to, to a longer life, life cycle. And that, that's quite a shift, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think the longest life cycle has two parts. One is while you're almost courting and kind of deciding if you can work with each other. But what we're trying to do as well now is we kind of use the phrase, how do you help people get ready for retirement? Because if I said to you, Nathan, are you retiring in the next 12 months? You'd kind of go, well, that's a big, quite... Yeah, don't tell even Jessica, but I'm thinking about it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, um, you don't look old enough, as I said. Um, <laughs> yeah, the big, big question, it's quite a commitment to say, well, yes or no. But if I said to you, you're probably going to retire in the next five years, a lot of people would say, yeah, hopefully, probably. I'm hoping I'll do this. The conversation changes from quite a defensive conversation of, well, I don't know, probably not, to, yeah, aspirational. Mm-hmm. And you get into that emotional bit. So I think we're trying to change that conversation. That doesn't mean about, you've got to be careful about how you frame it, because actually if you start framing about how much income you might have in retirement in five years' time, it's mm-hmm. still a long way away. If you all think back to five years ago in your life, look, I've, I've got two kids now that I didn't have. A five-year period in your life is quite a long time. And I think that's, a, that's the th- challenge. So I think it's about then having other things to engage them with. And I think one of the things we, we've talked about, and it's your, your phrase, which I love, which I've stolen and we've done some other stuff with is, but you know, you've got to solve the emotional to enable the functional finances bit. I think that's a, that's a key. Yeah, thing. I can't even remember saying that, but I'm glad that, I'm glad that. But no, we're going to definitely touch on some of that. I'm like, yeah, I, I do remember where we came from and, and it certainly came from, I think a lot of the customer interviews we gave where, as you say, a lot of these kind of, a lot of them were kind of known uh, issues and motive reasons people were given. But a lot of them you could see were just coming on. People maybe just not given, feeling they had permission to retire yet when the, when the finances were really, really in place. It was, it was uh, really, really interesting. And we're definitely going to, I mean, we always, we talked a little bit about the when and if they're going to retire. I think we'll come a little bit later onto the how, because that's definitely yeah. changing, like how you retire and, and what, what, what the time looks like. But I want to stay a little bit on um on the, the negative side, I guess, which is the is the the numbers. You know, it's been referred to. You know, I remember the, seeing the phrase like a pensions car crash, like sort of like waiting to happen. You know, in terms of you know people not saving enough, um, state state finances being stretched. You know, the state of um, you know the shift from uh, you know to um, the yeah just just the performance of kind of. Um, pension funds as well and all of the, and, and then yeah under saving so all of these things and, and aging life yeah. uh, longevity and, and increased health um all of these things coming together now people individuals do have a responsibility to, to, to save themselves so why, why do you think people don't i mean you know and, and that, that covers the why aren't people from their 20s through to their 60s you know, what, what what psychologically thinks come into play or economic? yeah, yeah look, i think Look, we're all human, human nature. We look at the experiences we understand. So you probably look to your parents, right? So you look at your parents and other people, how they've retired and saved for the future. And look, let's be honest, previously people were packed off with a carriage clock, some retirement drinks and a guaranteed wage in retirement from their employer. So if that employer invested the money badly or people live longer than expected um, or if the actuaries say they live too long, um, you know, the employer footed the bill. Um, that responsibility is all on the consumer. So I think it's a challenge of, it's only exacerbated by the 100 year life point, people living longer, hopefully in good health as well. Mm-hmm. Lots of people retiring now will probably spend as much time in that retirement as they did in their working life. But they don't think of that. That's, that's genuinely crazy. Yeah. You're going to mm-hmm. have that period of time. And it might be a slow pace or a different pace. Hopefully, a good proportion of it is in good health, but maybe not all of it is. So it's all those dynamics. But all that's kind of exacerbated by this extra choice that you have. And I think the big ch- challenge I see is whether it's the 20s or whatever, and we're going to become to automatic enrollment that's helped that, people don't realise that responsibility is on them. It's too intangible, it's too far away. So it's actually things like the power of behavioural science, you know, you've got to opt out of your workplace pension scheme now. That's been hugely successful. But the next challenge is when those people arrive at retirement, how are they able to execute it effectively? Because they were used to not having a choice, not having a decision. They was got that guaranteed paycheck and it's, that's really different uh, to suddenly make those decisions. And then, unfortunately, I think the industry becomes quite pension-centric. And look, we've done it uh, when we were kind of in the in various guises. I've, I've, I've seen it. Um, so, you know, we're all, we've all got a collective responsibility. But it becomes into more strange conversations around, well, could you get, for a pension, you get some tax-free cash at the time. So people are like, focus on that thing. It's kind of a simpler concept. But in isolation, it's not really the question you should be answering. And advice is a much broader conversation. So I think the challenge about the, the same, it comes back to that awareness, 
but also it's further ahead if you're younger well you might be saving for a house purchase now it, it, it's 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 priorities and i think you know the, the best of I'd, I'd love people to turn around in years to come and say god it was brilliant that i managed to um someone that sat next to at work told me i should put as much money in my pension as possible type thing what a, what a great piece of advice that was um and it's it's, it's that kind of challenge but i think Anything you can do to show the impact of it, and it's about confidence. And I think removing friction. The industry adds lots of friction. Like even when, you know, we had a point when in lockdown version one, we hadn't built e-signatures yet. Yeah. So we were asking customers to, we were asking one of our support team, you know, I remember having to, for risk, I had to buy, we had to buy her a bloody shredder <laughs> so that she could prove she had home printing. I bought, I bought it off Amazon. I just did it from my own. I was like, I'll buy you it. Just do it. We need to print these documents. Um, and then we were posting them out and people were signing them, returning to the office. You know, the friction. And, yeah. and if, you, if, you, if, you, if, it just, if you've got friction in your way, it just puts you off, especially if it's intangible. So what we've tried to do is bring the value exchange further forward, show them what's possible, and kind of try before you buy. You wouldn't buy a car without test driving it. There was someone, I was thinking someone from Vanguard, and he used that quote, and it was, it was brilliant. I loved it. Um, brilliant. And it's kind of, you know, in in fashion with that advice, a lot of people say well, you've got to you've got to you've got to pay before we'll let you even see what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. How do you remove that friction aspect to make it you know for something you've maybe not mm -hmm. had, definitely probably not had, given the numbers. Mm -hmm. How do you make it more real? I think that's a great point. I know you joined the the chat that we had with Pension B, and I think that one of the reasons Pension B was so successful is they just kept chipping away uh, to try and remove friction and, and make you know the migration of pensions and the consolidation of pensions so. So seamless, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, it won me over, and you know, and it, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's like when somebody once somebody makes your life easy and takes a problem away for you, you start to build trust with them as well. So, and so we're going to touch a little bit on the, the advice, like, um, and that's actually dialing back a little bit to you know, the, the hybrid offer that you that you're developing. So you talked a little bit about the fact that a hybrid offering can potentially bring costs down for a consumer. What are the other benefits? Do you think you know why? Why are you investing in building out a hybrid offer? What what what, what can the technology do for you? Uh, um, bank, and I know you you still have the bank of advisors in eighteen twenty five and yeah yeah, yeah. Um, the, now, the face to face yeah. So so what what can te technology bring? Do you think to to advice for both? benefits to consumers and, and to, you, to yourself as a business? Yeah, no, great question. There's two parts two parts to what we're doing with technology. I think there's digitization and there's, there's codification. So let's let's look at the digitization bit first. I think within that aspect, it's better customer experiences, right? Some things are just much better to do digitally. And let's, let, let's be honest. So I use Chrome, right? Chrome is my browser. I'm annoyed when the website doesn't let me do autofill and fill in my personal details when I'm buying something for the first time. Right, it's it's annoying. Lots of the information you're capturing from a, a customer for an advice person in a fact find. Some of it is what I call the hard facts that are boring. Unfortunately, I'm going to need your national insurance number at some point. But typing that in is much easier than reading it out and me typing it for you. It's all little things like that. But you know, planning with your partner, having to spell the name. I once listened to his call, and the advisor, God bless him, uh, the customer lived in North Allerton, so I'm in Yorkshire. I know where that's from, and he had no idea. He couldn't. He misheard it. And it was just this bizarre 90 seconds of really awkward conversation because sometimes it's easier to give data digitally. Sometimes it's easier to give it, give it verbally. So the technology can kind of do some of those things. It can make it much more convenient, right? Let's be really honest. The technology has to make it more convenient than a traditional business where you have to go to someone's house or you have to go to someone's office, mm -hmm. exacerbated by the lockdown and the pandemic stuff anywhere. But there's, there's that aspect. And the other aspects then is speed. Um, and that we haven't got that perfect yet. We, I've held my hands up. We've got to keep working on that in terms of driving. So because we've got things that aren't perfect and bits where you cover it, it goes from a fully automated to a bit manual and all the, the breaks in the process. But the speed could be a good thing linking to convenience because you can do it any time. So that genuinely can be convenient. Yeah. But then from a, from a kind of lowering the cost perspective, you've got more control. You can bring more standardization. You can bring more repeatability in. But I think the other thing you actually get is you should get better conversations with the consumer. You, you know, rather than me chit-chatting with you about the weather or your dog or your Amazon delivery to come in or whatever deliveries come in, you know, to build rapport, the real way you build rapport in financial planning is getting into those aspirational hopes and fears conversations. And by us capturing a bit of information online digitally, consuming some of that in an advice engine, we enable our financial planners to have that conversation earlier. That's how you build rapport having that valuable conversation earlier. And I think that 
I think that's key. So it kind of covers that whole spectrum of convenience, public digitization. Convenience in the sense that some things are easier just to do digitally than, than in person um, or over the phone, verbally. And I think then the other aspects then become around the speed, the consistency, the bringing value forward. But then there's a risk angle, right? There is a risk angle. Advice is really regulated. People have um, our second line risk function always an interest, understandably. The advice is perceived to be risky. Well, actually, it's got lots of controls around it. So that standardization can help. That That's really important. That'll happen for any industry. I think the closest industry I was thinking about is like pharmaceutical or kind of a healthcare. Um, I think something like Babylon Health actually is a really interesting thing that's, that, that was done. It's sim similar dynamics. Speaking to an expert, but how have you tried to either triage or or kind of, I don't know, do a bit of it up front? You, you get to know the digital body language by looking at what the customer's doing in advance, it's the equivalent of me looking out the window in the car park of the advice firm and saying, right, he's arrived in that car, or I'm looking at the lady's jewelry, or I'm looking, I'm not a thief, even though I'm from Hull, I promise, uh, or I'm looking at his watch. It's kind of, but you, you've got, you, you'd be building some social, you've got to be careful from unconscious bias, but you're building some clues and cues. Digitally, you can do a lot of that, that could suddenly mean a more targeted, better, meaningful, relevant conversation. And that's what it's about. Because if I said to you right at the start, it's intangible, I don't know what I'm getting. If you can get to the heart of the matter, it gives confidence. Do you think you'll ever be able to take the human out of the loop? I think for certain types of advice, right? At retirement on the onboarding, I'm not sure it's as easy as we think at the minute. Um, I'm not saying you can't. You know, again, it's fascinating watching Vanguard come into this market. They've been doing it in the US for eight years. They've had that background of it, whereas some of us are doing it for the first time. That I saw Richard was on the MG Wealth partnering with someone that done you know, all these things you can all these things have to be possible. If you don't believe you won't do it. I think for us, our focus now is in the ongoing advice. And I won't go into the technical detail, but there's a type of review you do where people's circumstances haven't really changed. I don't see any reason why the machine and the human don't need to be involved. The machine can do it, digitally can do it, and the and the engine can make the decision. There's no human. The question is. Do, do customers perceive digital to be free yeah. and think the value is the person? Whereas actually what the technology is doing is much more sophisticated than what one individual can do. It's had lots of brains go into it. And I think that's a really fascinating dynamic as an industry that we, and not, not as just every industry, digital is perceived to be cheaper, not as good. Well, actually it can be significantly better in lots of cases. I think there's a, that perception, that, as you say, you, you, want, um, you want the rapport, you want the empathy and, and the trust. And it just popped up and I can't open it up again, but Doug Brody was just made the point that, you know, you won't build that rapport with a 28-year-old trying to build it with a 65-year-old. I think you kind of want this, that image of what well, I'm paying for this, you know, I, I, I want the years of experience and, and the trust and, and knowing someone's been, been through all this before. That, 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 that's a brilliant question, um, a brilliant, brilliant observation. Actually, one, I was remember speaking to, when I first came into the role, spoke to one of our face-to-face -face financial advisors, and he was a young guy in his early 30s, late 20s. Um, he looked young. Um, and that, yeah. But what he said, when he used to go and see advisors first, uh, clients face-to-face, -face, especially when they were handed over from another advisor to him that was older, he would make sure he dressed very particularly. So he would always go suit tie, always, if he was seeing an older generation, which he wouldn't normally. For different people, it's fascinating because you're right. People have a perception again of what's required, and you know, now the reality is these people, our, our advisors, like one of the, one of our advisors, John, and, and the people will be laughing at me. Look, he looks really young, and we use his face on it all the time. Um, so it's kind of people might not appeal to that, but the reality is he spends all day every day speaking to people about retirement. Hmm. He knows it better than someone that does it a bit in a here and there. But look, they're the things that human biases that we all have. One of the things we're also playing with is going. How do you start to look at um, how you might deploy? Uh, a female customer with a female financial planner because you do see kind of stories of confidence. Yeah, we, that, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. we haven't we haven't done it as a choice yet, but we do make sure we when we use the the kind of um, we use the human in digitally in the sense of with a pop up in the journey and it's in it's on random variation. Um, but you know we could test does it have a bigger impact with with certain people younger female male all that difference. So yeah, just need to be all the chance to be more sophisticated. It comes back again. That digital bio language and the ability probably haven't talked about on the on the digital side you get more data you get data in a structured format that you can analyze and actually then it's how you use it and draw conclusions that's great yeah 
And we'll come and talk about how you innovate. But let's take a little break for a half an hour and to, for a couple of questions. Got some great ones. Um, uh, Leanne was straight in there. So Leanne's uh, one of my colleagues. Um, uh, it, you know, is there a particular myth around pensions that you see pop up a lot that isn't true? The fun. Uh, no, um, the, uh, the, 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 they are fun. The, the one I would say is that comes up all the time is people have this concept of this of, of tax-free cash. That's so five percent of your pension pot tax-free. Yeah. And what people either say, say, say is, I have to take it. Yeah. And for some pensions, this, 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 for the majority of what pensions have now, we're probably what the majority of the people on the call have got, um, you don't have to take it. You don't have to take it in a one -er. That's the another big one. People assume that, or if I'm going to take it, I have to take the full 25%. You don't. You don't have to do that. And that's not great necessarily from a tax planning perspective. You should feed it in at certain times, depending on your other sources of income. And I think the third one, then the more worrying one is you get the other people where it's, um, it, the, the phrase one of our advisors uses is intelligently misinformed. And it's, it's not a criticism of the customers. They've done that bit of research. They are trying to cut through all this complexity. And then they say, well, I've heard about this tax-free cash. I know it's 25%. And then they say, can I take it every year? And you're like, well, no, unfortunately not. You, you've got a pot or an allowance and we can spread it. But it's just interesting. It's kind of a little bit of knowledge. And I think, you know, it's the same as all of us. It's like, I always think when, I, when you're buying a washing machine, a washing machine is just broken. You're then suddenly an expert on spin cycles and, and all the, but normally you wouldn't be. Or buying a duvet, you know about togs. It's industry jargon. And it's how do you, how do you make sure from a financial advice perspective, a pension perspective, a retirement perspective, you can cut through it and help customers make decisions. The challenge I think is, from a, the industry, pension providers give don't often always give advice. Some do, and it's how you get that blend of decision support for help and help and support. But um, the difference between guidance and advice for me is guidance can tell you what you could do, and advice tells you what you should do. And I think that should is so important that that, that can make such a big difference. You don't have to do it, but at least someone giving you an opinion that should be relevant and suitable to, to what you're trying to achieve. I have another question um, from Graham Carmichael, uh, M G. Um, obviously looking to get some tips. Um, but yeah, um, what, what do we think uh, ongoing advice will look like in a digital world? And we touched on this a little bit. I think this idea of taking it from a, an event through to a service, I guess, you know, and something that's maybe with you through some of these, through these, through these life stages. You know, it, you know it, is there a product there or a service, do, do we think? Um, and, and how much of a digital component might, might, might there be to that? In the ongoing service, just to yeah, it's ongoing uh, advice. I think you know. I think I think I think diff again different life stages, right? So I think for us in in retirement and drawing down an income, and that income can move up and down based on the performance of where it's invested. I think it is important to to kind of have an ongoing service, right? The nature of those touch points could be quite different, and that's why we're kind of thinking about actually what we would call rather than, you know advisors have to make some, meet certain rules and make sure they can justify the ongoing advice fee. And this is maybe sometimes where the, the reputation is bad because sometimes nothing really changes, but you've got someone on hand to deal with it if it does. And what we want to try and do is, is there a way because of the technology, we've got a greater view of when it's more likely to be a significant change. It's not like AI or anything. It's just going, we've planned out, you are planning to spend extra money for your golden wedding anniversary. You are planning to do part-time work and actually you think you're going to stop in three years. So you know there's these more uncertain events. And I think what we want to try and do is dial up or dial down the, the, the kind of the, the nature of the interaction because some, it's sometimes a one-size-fit-all. Well, nothing's changed. We're still going to come and speak to you because that's how we're justifying our service. Whereas actually, really, if we can justify our service and make sure the plan is up to date, I think one of the questions, it's a quote that I've kind of got in my notes, which I love, retirement does not equal pensions. I am absolutely on you with that. I totally agree. And I think it's... How do you manage those things? Because things can change in your life. Um, but I think there's a more opportunity in the ongoing service to do digital stuff. But the issue comes back to what we talked about before around, do people think the human is the value bit? And like we're genuinely having a conversation around, um, do we need to slow it down? You, know, you might have already worked out the answer from a data capture, consume the information, nothing's really changed. We know the plan's still suitable and appropriate and ongoing. Should we put a false kind of, we're going to wait to look at it. I'm going to come back to you with your updated report in a few days, almost to kind of a bit of theatre. Now, we're not, we're not trying to mislead customers, but that actually may be a perverse thing where it gives more confidence. So we're trying to look at things, that, and it might be completely flawed thinking, might be completely flawed 
we're just trying to think of some of those kind of different opportunities potentially. I think <laughs> riffing a little on Reese Nielsen off asked some questions, we covered some of his earlier points, but I think, you know, he was saying, you know, um, retirement doesn't need people pensions and, and vice versa. Um, but there's a question there, I think, about, you know, just, I guess the appropriateness of the products that there's a, the advice that you can offer, the, you know, can, given the complexity of, of what retirement is now, you know, no two retirements are alike, you know, is the advice products fit for purpose can you can you cope with all of this um you know the diversion possibilities and are the products behind the advice you know still appropriate these days to do, do we think for the for the for the fast changing nature of, of of what retirement is today yeah I, I think the kind of underlying product set and the underlying regulations haven't really innovated a lot i think the regulator knows that they've had a few call for kind of inputs you could probably argue that the rules are analog rules for a digital world, uh, if I'm honest. So it's how do, you, how, do you, how do you deal with that? I think product set hasn't changed. But I don't think that's necessarily a problem because what you need to have is a broad enough view. That pension, every time doesn't equal pension. You know, what we're trying to factor into a retirement plan is part-time working. Um, maybe you've got some, you're lucky enough to have some rental income. Maybe you're going to have an inheritance or downsize in the future. These things aren't financial products, but they're going to have such a driver on um, the, the overall way you shape that income that you take from a product or invest money is absolutely key. So I think it, I think it does vary. I think there could be more innovation in the underlying products. Yeah. I think guarantees have a role to play, um, which they haven't for a long time. People have moved away from annuities potentially. They might, I think that'll come back. Um, yeah. But I think the other thing says you get your state pension, right? Your state pension's your underpin. But the, the, it's how you deal with that bit that we call the bridging period. I think that's where our service is really strong. That kind of period between before my state pensions come in, I might be part-time working. So I've got a source of income. What's the most tax efficient way to access my savings, my life savings and kind of, and kind of drive that out? Yeah. We've got so many great questions um, and we've already gone wildly off scripts, Ben. Uh, well, not we really had a script, but still. Okay. I do want to, there's a couple of one I do want to cover because this again, a particular bugbear of mine. Um, is marketing and the, uh, marketing to the over 50s um, and the way that over 50s are represented in, in marketing. And it's not just in financial services, but financial services have, have typically been pretty bad at it. So the, the over 50s um, have 70% of the wealth in the UK. And, and uh, I remember reading a couple of years back that only 5% of marketing spend is directed at them. So that for, for one, they were massively underserved mm. segment. And then when you do see a lot of the messages, it's normally about, you're going to get old, you're going to get ill, you're going to get, you're going to die, you know, yeah. or the only thing that's going to be of interest in your life is your grandkids. Now, obviously everybody loves yeah. their grandkids, but it's not the only thing that's going on in, in, in their lives. How, so what's, what's your view on, you know, how to engage in, you know, the, you know this, this really important um, and diverse market? And what did you learn, I guess, in, in terms of in your recent class of 2021 20, survey um, about the lives that these, that this segment's living? That maybe 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 wasn't this you know bucks the stereo, stereotypical trends. Yeah, look, so I'll, I'll, I'll come to the class. I explain what the class of twenty twenty one research is and, and kind of come to that. I think just just pick on your first point around the the old piece. I think you've got to solve that emotional to enable the functional, and the functional <clears throat> from the industry. The focus is very much that functional, and I think because people hear directly from their pension providers with honest, let's be honest, a, a pension centric uh, message, it risks coming across as old. And I think one of the things we found in the research, actually, uh, the, the class of research, uh, was one in three people that were retiring, a worry for that one in three was that the act of retiring, they would then be, see, be perceived to be old. Like that in itself was a problem. That, that was putting them off. That's, that was a worry. And then you come back to that point about actually making the decision. So I think from a kind of um, an acquisition perspective, one of the phrases, the terms from AdWords and Google Early retirement, perhaps unsurprisingly, is the one we've seen an important search term when it comes to retirement advice and researching. Because um, it's probably got a typically more aspirational intent to get your retirement wish list and start exploring that life you've, you've not let live. So I think we've just got to be careful that we don't stereotypically do something. But I will caveat that with, and I hate this, um, but, it, but it's, it's cliche, right? But it keeps coming up and it's kind of, I find it annoying, right? Um, but cliche keeps going up. For all I'm saying, don't want to see people be seen as old, don't want to have stereotypes. Honestly, everyone, not like everyone, but so many people we speak to disproportionately, they say they want to buy a caravan. 
<laughs> it's like you came up with some user testing right at the start of the program and it just keeps coming up with customers now so i think that with all this chat around portugal and green and amber and red list and all that stuff well the whole industries are struggling everywhere aviation bloody hell the gap the caravan and motor motor right. is booming it's pretty, uh, money, it's pretty money in caravans it's bizarre um so i think the over 50s are an interesting bunch they, they are old considering how long they're expected to live and how long they could spend in that, that next phase. But look, let's just look at that class of 2021 research because um, what we did was, just for people to give some context to it, was we, we did some, we surveyed people, a thousand people who had retired in 2020, and obviously a strange year, and a thousand people planning to retire in 2021 and what we call our class of report. So we'll follow the, each year, the sentiments, the feelings, and the challenges of people retiring in those years, those cohorts or those classes, like an American kind of graduation type thing. Um, and I have to be honest, I felt really privileged reading some of the, the free text, the verbatim comments. There was one of the questions for the, the people that retired in 2020. We said, what would be your advice to someone retiring in the next 12 months? And again, advice, not financial advice, not regulated advice, just tips, hints and tricks. Um, and we had over, from the 1,000 people, so it, was a, it wasn't a mandatory question, we had over 800 free text responses. So what, what a conversion kind of response. People were always willing to give their opinion, I suppose, but it was so insightful. There were so many things of um, do it, um, you know, positive stuff, seize the day type. Although I have to admit there was a personal favorite, a beautiful type of um, carpet DM rather than carpet DM. That was a, that was a good one. Um, but for me, the biggest aspect was the emotional element, uh, the positive anticipation, but also that genuine apprehensions from some and the importance of having a plan and a plan mm -hmm. being across emotional, physical and financial. Um, and the physical bits about being active, often health related, but some of the things they want to do, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to go, you know, gardening still comes up, right? There's still some stereotypical stuff being close to nature, but there's lots of active stuff still coming up as well in terms of what they want to do at the time. But I think one element, um, you know, it's it's so important just having, you can't just have one part of it, you need to have a few things within it. And I think that's where, um, we haven't really touched on it yet, but part-time work is so key. Whether part-time work is um, paid or unpaid, actually i think that's a, a really fascinating um fascinating thing because knowing whether you're doing part-time work whether paid or unpaid for your finances and this is why i'm such a big believer it's been included in the financial plan um knowing that you're doing it because you need it for your finances to be planned to your time of plan to stack up and actually you might be doing it because you need the money or you might be doing it because you can't afford to work full-time because health caring commitments with grandkids potentially or other, other caring commitments or are you doing the part-time work paid or unpaid purely for mm -hmm. stimulation and enjoyment um, and that genuinely the paycheck is an afterthought? And I think by having the financial planner and the financial advice be able to know, you look at that and you know the reason why. If you know the primary driver is that social interaction, that purpose, that mental stimulation, well, actually, it's the emotional aspects. And you having that huge understanding and clarity and confidence gives you freeing flexibility to, to act if you stopped enjoying it for any reason now imagine all of us right we've all had days and i'm worried now my team so my team are on this call they've all had days where they've my boss to do my head in i'm gonna pack it all in imagine knowing you could just pack it all in it takes the pressure off the stress and actually that was what, what a difference that can make so part-time work for me is something that i think could make a huge difference to, to consumers and that over 50s group the challenge i would have is and i'm, I'm going to talk on tuesday with the pension life and service association the challenge I would throw to employers is I don't think employers are set up to do it. I think they give it a bit of lip service that we support flexible working, we support yeah. transition. I think we can change through, through this year that maybe maybe we you know we will see some more flexibility in the workplace. Um, I think we're coming we're coming up on time, and there's one couple of questions I want to want to um, I want to get off pretty quickly, I think, and then we'll um, uh, we'll, we'll close off with another couple of questions. So one is like um, innovation, you know, uh, is you know, I, I genuinely feel what, what you guys are, are doing, are attempting to do is, uh, it's, is, you know, is innovative and pushing, pushing the product. Um, is, is there much innovation in your space? Are you, are you seeing much innovation in your space? And, and, and also how, um, you know, any tips and tricks to, 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 to innovate in, in, a, in, a, in a quite a governed and in, and in standard life, Nadine, let's just be honest, a behemoth you know, uh, of, uh, of an organization. Um, yeah, how, how do you innovate and, you know, and, and who's, what's driving innovation for you? Yeah, let's do the second part of that question first. So 
I think it's about having the confidence to be progressive, having trust in each other that some things will fail, and really importantly, acknowledging that they've failed. It's not a blame game, but it's so important to acknowledge, do the acknowledgement part, because then you've concluded. You've concluded that something was learned. And otherwise, you end up going through a cycle and you say, oh, we'll do an idea that was pretty much the same as the other one, because you've not naturally concluded and looked at your data enough. So it does come down to materiality and knowing sometimes that you need to break the rules a bit. And look, um, you've worked with them. Some of my team won't do that more than others. And look, I, I love working with them. But the challenge I have is creating an, an environment to let them do it effectively because their intentions are always based on ambition and progressiveness. They're not trying to do something dodgy, but it's kind of how we, how we navigate that large organisation. I think there's, there's kind of disciplines you want from a startup that let's not pretend you are a startup in a big company, you're not, but you can you can do some of the disciplines. So I think things are put, that, put your offer in the hand of your customers quickly, listen to what they're saying and doing, also what they're not doing. Do you use testing? Do UX research? We use a UX researcher, which I think is great. But he, God, I used to hate the meetings with him because he'd tell you this stuff and holds this mirror right in your face. And you're like, oh, please, please read by any chance. David, David Hamill, yeah. <laughs> but but, but we, I used to hate them. Me and Andy used to go, oh, apprehension. But yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't hold back. The difference. Such a difference to us. That was really important. I think look at their live user journeys, that digital boy language, whether it's full story or other kit. Um, and look, and for me, having previously done client facing roles, um, I'm a massive fan of listening to the practitioners that are on the front line on the cold face speaking to customers every day. Yeah. But colleague and customer feedback loops are key. I think the one challenge I'd say, the thing I observe is if you're listening to them, sometimes they, they might get disengaged by you then not suddenly, suddenly then going on a backlog. It doesn't mean that you listen to them, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to immediately solve their problem. But that feedback loop is absolutely key and see things change. Yeah. I think the other thing I'm kind of learning at the minute, it's a really interesting challenge of it as we go through a different stage of maturity and some of the people on the call will be at different stages in this process. I think it's about the timing. When is the timing of your progressive idea or innovation pitched in terms of that stage of maturity or what the competitive environment is doing? So I would say it's about closing what I would call the size of the belief gap or the credibility gap, because sometimes the size of that gap suddenly becomes smaller because a competitor has done it or actually because you've made some other connected adjacent steps that suddenly make it seem more doable. Mm-hmm. I would actually say you have to be opportunistic. So actually, look, I know there's some guys on the, on the phone from M&G uh, today. I've said, look, M&G are in here now. What a big company, what a great company. They're going to be all over this. So I'm using some of that to agitate a little bit because I've got that kind of bit of content and vanguard a couple of months before. It's helpful. The market's hot enough. Mm-hmm. And, and I think we're discussing things now that we probably brought up two years ago. And, and I wasn't leading the area at the time. And I was probably sitting there in the team kind of going, to be frank, some of these ideas sounded fanciful. Like it was just not credible. No one believed it was possible and it was a distraction. Whereas now people inside and outside the team can see, given progress here, here and here. Can I see you can see big, so if you can shut that belief, close the belief gap, close the credibility gap, get your timing right. I think that's what I would encourage. And look, yeah, you've got to bring risk with you at certain points, but I think everyone knows that. And it's just trying to get the right, Right, right challenge and managing the dependencies, not giving, you know, no free decisions. So I'm a big believer in conscious decisions. Sometimes certain areas sign things off and it's free. There's no consequence to their decisions. How do you put them, well, there's a consequence to that decision. This is the consequence. And will they still make the same one they would have done if they, if they, if they thought it was a free decision? Let's get a couple of questions. Dave's asked a great one, uh, Dave Ward around DSG, um, environmental sustainable governance. Uh, and um, yeah, you know, put your money um, where it's going to make a difference. And um, you read an article recently indicating the public say one thing, they want companies to act ethically, then act another way when it comes to the decisions they're making about their own money. Um, so is ESG influencing um, retirement decisions or where the money kind of goes? Does it come up in those kind of conversations? Um, you know, and when it comes to ethical issues, is it, is it a challenge for the advice market? Okay, so um, from a Sun Life Aberdeen perspective, or soon to be Aberdeen perspective, look, we're massive, massive fans and massive supporters of ESG. We think it's hugely important from a kind of, we have large shareholders and companies, we've got influence, really, really important. So it will move. When I was in my kind of workplace role, I used to spend time with employees in, in workplace. So the challenge you've got is lots of people don't even know they're in, the, if they know they're saving into a pension or for retirement is good, they don't necessarily even know they're invested, the, 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 the lay person on the street. So Making the connection um, between you still there, Nathan? Yeah. So you was really still. I was like, have I dropped off? I was just checking like, the question list where you chatting. Um, so I was really still. I've dropped off the Wi-Fi. So really, really, really um, 
really important, but are they making that connection? So I think it's, it comes down to, do people, is the investment the most important part for people? And I, I personally, and customers we speak to, it's not at the minute, really honest. That I think something will cause those triggers and it is important. And I think big institutions have a responsibility to drive better outcomes for it. But when you talk about the individual decision maker, I'm not sure that that's the immediate concern. Maybe you could have some clever kind of whizzy things for a different younger generation on starting serving might be a way to appeal to them. You have to make it tangible. Again, how are they actually influencing the customers at the company's decisions? So I think for us at retirement, we've not yet seen it come through. We could consider it. There's some regulations that you need to kind of keep an eye on that have kind of been talked about ESG and choices. But I think the, the thing we need to be kind of mindful of is it's more about being retirement more than pension, what it means in your life, all that kind of other aspects. I think I think would have a more bigger impact than the choice of investment decision. But look, we all want to feel warm and fuzzy about ourselves, but we all convince ourselves we're all not rational, right? We'll convince ourselves, well, yeah. I'm going to buy that for me because it's good, you know. It, but it's a flawed argument from your previous purchase that you've decided for. So we just need to be realistic of that. I think I think we're all complex characters. But look, institutions, I think, have a huge role to play. I'm not yet seeing it come through to the individual, but that doesn't mean it won't come. And it's going to be what causes that trigger. Um, um, I think we'll, we'll nearly wrap up. I, we always ask everybody about, um, how, you know, we strong believers in healthy, happy teams. You know, you can't get anything done, you know, unless you're kind of working well and working well together, you know, so create future. We we do a lot to try and, you know, work, work closely with the clients and also to, you know, to invest in that, in our teams. Um, to keep them healthy and happy. What have you been doing over the last 12 months, you know, to kind of keep people um, healthy, happy, motivated and, 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 and moving the product forward, you know, uh, through, through this period of disruption? Yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been funny. Like, you know, we were a co-located cross-functional team. I don't think uh, let's all never, never see each other in person for a year and uh, all work from home was probably top of our list for increasing productivity and innovation. But I think the guys have done really well. There was initial friction about access initially, but I think, couple of things I think they did and I think what I would describe it as how do you get the impromptu and the informal that's the bit that's been hard to create and how do you recreate that that's so powerful because the impromptu and the informal are the things that give you the boost the coffee filter or wandering to the canteen it's the boost you get it's the laugh it's the energy it's the great idea it's the connection how do you create that and I think the nature of uh, being remote you have to effectively um have a little bit more formality because you've got to at least tell people the time to turn up. So it's, it's by nature, it's got a meeting invite for even for the informal thing. So the guys are doing great at the start, which was we used a bit of kit called Whereby and we just set up a, a, a room that was called the Coffee Lounge and people could just wander into it, dial into the video conference, have a chat, 15 minutes, 9.15 on a, um, on, a, on a couple of mornings in a week. So that was great. But again, it's how do you keep things fresh? And it, that, those things were on the course. And then the other thing we did was we made sure we had time in the day, tried to encourage people not to have meetings so they could get outside in the light, you know, most of the team invest in Scotland. That time period of light isn't long. You know that, Nathan. You know, you've got to get out in the daylight. So there's all those aspects. So I think we've done those things. I think going forward, the really hard thing is people have got different preferences now. Yeah. Like some spend on life stage want to want to work from home. Some want to be a desperate to be in the office. And I think we've all got to be really cognizant of what do other people think and avoid any unconscious bias. Uh, I have a massive fear of like suddenly seeing this meeting that will be four people in the office sat at desks within earshot of each other having mm. to go on, on mute on teams with one other person at home because four are in the office and one are at home and mm. actually the four in the office thinking why the hell have we come in so I think you have to be really clear about for what environment for what task are you kind of solve and I think being really organized when the right people are in the in the environment in an office or not so I think sprint cycles could work quite well for that about certain yeah. days certain <laughs> ceremonies you're in I know you normally work at home, but come in for this. Let's work yeah, on this yeah, sure. yeah, we'll I think I think everyone's done fantastically well. I think people have been really innovative, but it's been a drag as well. Let's not kid ourselves. It's not had a, some negative impacts, but I think overall right. people, well, I've been lucky to see more of the kids, I have to admit. I've got Good. A, Good. you know, a nearly two and nearly four year old. That's been that's been great. Right. Well, look, uh, it's been a fantastic chat. I um it's just a great topic. I could, could keep chatting, but we're running to the end of our time. So I'm going to say thank you and um, I'm sure everybody uh, will join me in, in that as well. Um, we uh, we will type a summary of this up and, and uh, it will go on as a blog post um, if you wanted to just kind of recap on, on stuff as well. And then the video will go up in a, in a few days as well. Uh, we'll share share that around. Um, yeah, but for now, uh, just thanks again on a, on a Friday for, 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 for Ben for joining us and, and thanks to everybody else who, who came. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, a couple of thanks coming up in the chat. So thanks for that. It's really appreciated. Um, have a great day, everybody. Um, announcement on the next one. I think we're planning on to do name these probably every kind of couple of months. And actually, we'll be bringing some other different types of chats. So we're we're, we're lining up a, one on co-design uh, with the Ulster University. So keep an eye out for that. That's coming up soon. Um, so, um, but for now, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks again, Ben. Yeah, um, thanks, everyone. That was really good. Good to see you, Neff. And hope your package comes. And uh, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, great, great. Thanks very much. Take care, everybody. Enjoy your weekends. Bye.